This morning, I brewed an entire travel mug of coffee using cold water. <laughs> I just never turned the kettle on, but I carried on making coffee anyway. And I didn't even notice until like five minutes later when I took the first sip and it was cold. But even then, I didn't catch it. I was like, huh, this travel mug is busted. How did my coffee already get this cold after just five minutes? Then it clicked. Wait a minute. Actually, it was really weird that it was so hard to push down the plunger today on the AeroPress, and the water didn't froth up as much when I poured it over the grounds. There was no steam at any point in the process. And yeah, coffee doesn't just go from boiling to cold in five minutes. How did I miss it? I've made coffee like a billion times, even when every step in the process was a little bit off this morning, and I was aware of those things in the moment, I still carried on like everything was fine. I, I like to think I'm a careful thinker, but nobody can do that all the time. I had been duped by myself. Actually, I almost legitimately got scammed a couple months ago. My new obsession these days is letterpress printing. And on one of the letterpress groups on social media, some guy posted that he was selling a small printing press at an incredible price. So I message him immediately to ask if it's still available. He says, yes, I think, score, this thing is mine. And I was about ready to shell out the cash. But luckily, I thought to ask a follow-up question. And his response it was a little off. I couldn't say what it was exactly, but he just seemed a little too willing to sell this thing under any terms. And so I, I got nervous and quietly ghosted him. A few weeks later on the same group, someone posted that they had been scammed. They sent a bunch of money to a guy selling a small printing press, and that guy promptly fled the proverbial town. In the comments, people were checking out the scammer's profile, and it was so clearly fake. <laughs> also, the guy who almost scammed me was using the same profile picture and only a very slightly different name than in the profile they were using to scam this other guy. If I had done any amount of looking into things first, I would have stayed away from the beginning. But I didn't. I had made coffee with cold water, but now I know to be more careful. And you should too. You're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from, and how they change. I'm Andy Luttrell. It's good to be back. If you missed my summer miniseries on science communication, it was really good, if I do say so. So check that out. But we're back to the classic opinion science programming after a few months, and I've got some fun stuff in store. To kick things off, I'm pleased to share my conversation with psychologists Dan Simons and Chris Chabri. They have a new book out called Nobody's Fool – why we get taken in, and what we can do about it. It lays out a psychological account of how people can fall prey to scams and cons, how our very smart brains can get duped into making some very dumb decisions. The book came out in July, although I talked to Dan and Chris about a month before then. By the way, you may already know Dan and Chris's work. It's come up before on this show. They're probably most famous for their Invisible Gorilla study. That study came out in 1999, and they wrote their first book inspired by it in 2010. Since that study came up a few times when I talked to Dan and Chris, I wanted to give you some context for it. So here's a clip from my episode on the psychology of magic, where I describe the study. As much as we might want to pay attention to everything, we can't. Our attention zeroes in on whatever we think is relevant in the moment, and we miss other stuff that isn't relevant even big, otherwise obvious other things. Probably the most famous experiment on this asks people to watch a simple video of people passing basketballs between each other and count the total number of times people wearing white shirts pass the ball. It's not easy. There are six people in the video, two basketballs, and they're moving around constantly. But in the midst of this chaos, someone wearing a full gorilla costume walks into the group, looks dead into the camera, beats their chest, and walks off screen. You would absolutely think this is something you would notice, but lots of people do not. The experiment has come to be known as the Invisible Gorilla Experiment, and I still remember watching this video in my AP Psychology class in high school. 
And I had absolutely no idea that a gorilla played a prominent role in the video after I saw it for the first time. My attention was on the basketballs. I had been misdirected. As you can imagine, staring straight at a gorilla and not seeing it is not a far cry from getting scammed by a con artist and not realizing what's going on. So I was excited to talk to Dan Simons and Chris Chabri about their work together, their inspirations, and what psychology has to say about how we get fooled. So so you guys have been, like, partnered together <laughs> for some time, uh, and I don't really know the story of that very well. So like, what is what is the biography of you two being a, a writing unit, uh, an academic unit? Well, I mean, we uh, I, I was a professor at Harvard um, early in my career. And when Chris was a grad student there, and then eventually a, a postdoc, and then a fellow and then lots of other roles. But um, Chris uh, was a teaching assistant in in my cognitive psychology class, and then in a lab class where we started working on the gorilla video. So that that was one of the class projects in that class. So that that's um, where that that began. Yeah, I mean, we corresponded actually before I was at Harvard about some of Chris's work on chess um, hmm. and and on change detection. But uh, we started collaborating. I think that was the first kind of collaboration, right? I, I, yeah, I, I knew your brother because he was uh, he was at Harvard and he was he played chess also. So I think I knew him like through the the Harvard Chess Club or something like that. We had these weird sort of connections but i think actually i might have confused dan for his brother when he first like showed up <laughs> as a professor at harvard because i like you know they both start with d a you know they you know and, and so on it's um uh it was a little bit of a confusing beginning but thanks to physical proximity being down the hall from each other uh and um being able to work together in these in these courses we really started you know into the research from initially being uh you know uh me, you know, being a teaching assistant for the classes. Hmm. So, so w what is the chess story? Like, this seems to be like the the fundamental core to to the Chris Chabri story. <laughs> <laughs> to the Chris Chabri story. Well, uh, I learned how to play chess a long time ago, but it's true that it's always been a large part of my identity. Um, and you know, I played tournament chess. I became a chess master. I was in charge of the chess club at Harvard as an undergraduate and then couldn't let go and kept on helping out like after I was, uh, you know, an alumnus and so on. But the, the, the most important part, I think, is that when I, you know, I partly got into psychology in the first place because of chess, because I was really interested in computer chess and then uh, took a psychology course and, and found out that there was this whole uh, line of research on how humans play chess, which is sort of the some of the foundational research on expertise and uh, you know, in, in humans and all things, but you know, a lot of a lot of the leading people in psychology who are looking at this were interested in chess, um, like in computer science, um, and so I, I got I, I got into that, and that was like my first real paper that I tried to do any research on was cognitive psychology and chess, and mm. kept on working on it for my PhD thesis. Dan, you know, Dan's a chess player also, and he was on my thesis committee as as well, and um, it's sort of always been a a part of what I'm what I'm doing, and it's uh, you know it's kind of like in the book. It's 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 a topic which touches many other areas. You could sort of, you know chess is its own little world, like it's got everything in it, you know, in some way or another. So it's always something you can come back to and and find something interesting in. Yeah, I wondered how much that was sort of like um, always um, marriage the whole time. This chess and psychology thing versus. Like only later do you go, oh, these two things that I have independently come upon <laughs> actually have a lot to say about one another. But it seems like kind of from the early days, like chess was a vehicle to get into thinking about how people make decisions and think about the world. Um, kind of. I mean, it really got me into partly got me into computer science and artificial intelligence. So this was like AI, like 1.0, you know, or something like back. We're talking about back in the 1980s, you know, when when getting a computer to play chess is as good as a master, you know, not as opposed to the world champion was a big deal. So I got into artificial intelligence that way, and it was through that that I get into cognitive psychology. Um, and it's always, you know, there's always random things that happen. Like my best friend was, you know, took a course in the psychology department, you know, and, and so on. I probably wouldn't have, you know, there's always those things that happen, right? But the, the chess was always, you know, chess was always part of it somehow. And of course, there's a long history of, of chess research in cognitive psychology, right? going back to the early days of it, because it, it's a really well-defined domain for studying decision-making and memory and expertise. So. 
So, so you've at some point in the book you you write that uh, this particular book has been in the works for a long time. I couldn't tell if it was like, oh, in the last year or two, you sort of hatched this new idea and and cracked it. Uh, but it sounds more like this was an idea that's been floating around for a long time. So where where did the idea for this book come from? And, and what has it taken to pull all the pieces together? Well, I mean, we, we went through multiple proposals that we kind of would put together, write the whole proposal, write drafts of, you know, summaries of chapters. And then drop them because it just it just didn't quite hold together, and we couldn't we, we weren't finding the right theme. So sometimes it ended up being too much on the sort of an, the self help end of things. Sometimes it was too much on the science end of things. Um, the themes that we we wrote about in this book were ones that kind of were part of all of those proposals, just not in the right grouping. And it took us a while to find that that structure. Um, some of the themes, like the the themes in the first chapter. Um, the idea of thinking about what's missing was a central theme in an early draft of the proposal. Um, but all along, we were kind of gathering material. Really, since the publication of our last book, we've been gathering new material that wasn't directly on topic of the last book, but was interesting to us. And it kind of all gradually built. Um, so I think we finally arrived at this version of the organization just a couple of years ago. But um, what was it always about, you know, how, how to avoid being fooled? Um, it was always, it, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say it was always about that topic. That was kind of the coherent organization that we came up with eventually after we kind of looked at all of the information we had. And all the I'd say it turned had. out to be about that. I, I yeah. would say it turned out to be about that. Like we, like, like Dan said, we had a lot of different ideas and we were trying to find the pattern and the theme and the core, you know, that would make them into not just a good collection of ideas, but a good book that, you know, was really like had a, a, a clear focus. And um, Dan actually suggested that we should make sure that it's all oriented towards different ways that people try to deceive us and why that works and, and what we can, you know, and what we can do about it. And those elements had been in there for quite a while because uh, we really, I think, at least in my mind, we had started out with the idea of doing sort of in a way, the flip side of some of what was in the Invisible Gorilla, that is what we can do about it. So an early working title was Seeing What You're Missing. Um, which was sort of the opposite of the invisible gorilla in a way, like seeing what you know, seeing what you're missing. And um, but I think the idea of centering it around deception also became more um, culturally relevant as time went on. Um, where you know you see you know the rise of fake news and misinformation in social media, and you know more stories about scamming and cheating and fraud and you know and, and so on. It just seemed like it, it was it was the right theme to collect everything. And then it was actually I think pretty easy to come up with a. A very good proposal. And once we had that theme in place, yeah, the first book was really about how our intuitions about our own minds don't don't necessarily get it right, right. And then this book is much more about how sort of our cognitive tendencies can can lead us astray, um, or can be can be misused or can be hijacked to to lead us wrong. So, so I'm curious. So uh, it all came out well because as I read it, I thought, well, this could only ever have been a book about <laughs> how to avoid being fooled. Uh, so, so I'm curious a little bit, like if that wasn't the guiding, like you were clearly chasing something, right? There was a seed of something that seemed worth pursuing before this frame came about. And so, what what was that like for you guys? Like, what what is this book doing for you? Like, what kind of question is it answering? If it's not specifically about uh, avoiding being fooled. Oh, I can't remember anything like that. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, but it's but we've worked on this so much that honestly, I was as you were asking the question, yeah. I was having a little bit of a little bit of difficulty recalling, you know, all the different iterations of what we were doing. Like I said, I mentioned, seeing what you're missing was an early working title, so there was always the idea that we would provide, I think, like maybe more practical advice to people on how to avoid, um, you know misleading themselves, like falling into the trap of intuition and not realizing, you know, not understanding how your your minds work. But the idea of like the adversary who's trying to take advantage of that, you know, that that really unified that I, I don't think, you know, I don't think was there. But we did always have the idea to sort of try to go, you know, th th this book, I think, was always going to be a little bit less, a lot of cool uh, studies and experiments and so on, and a little bit more practical, you know, practical uh, ideas. And I would say it's hard for me as a, you know, as, as mainly a scientist to, to really step out there and tell people exactly how they should live their lives and so right. on. So, I, But I think we did come up with, 
some some very practical and simple ideas that hopefully will you know they, they're not going to solve everyone's problems in the world, but I think if readers really think about them, they'll get better at not being tricked and deceived and so on. And that that was really the, the goal, I think, was just to help people get better and think about it in a different way rather than, you know, pretend to solve all their problems with this one weird old trick, you know, which is itself a form of deception, of course. In that way, it reminds me a little bit of Cialdini's Principles of Influence book, where it's sort of like the the packaging is here's how other people in the world influence your choices and get you to buy things and donate to causes and here's how you can protect against you know undue influence but really it's a book about the psychology of uh, persuasion <laughs> and behavior and, and choice and that kind of seems like the the essence i got from this book was like that too where it's like there is a story that you could get from this that's not simply like oh how do people reason <laughs> but is about oh how do i navigate the world but you guys are probably coming at it more from like, well, what we know is how people reason <laughs> and what are the things that chip away at, at people's choices. Yeah, what, what's the sort of cognitive underpinnings of how we function, right? How we get around in the world, how we communicate with other people, how we interact. Um, all of that sort of has to work the majority of the time. And uh, yeah, so we were coming at it from the perspective of what are our kind of ways of thinking? What are our tendencies? What kinds of information do we find appealing and why? Right. And then how do people take advantage of that when they're looking to deceive us? And one of the things I think we discovered as we kind of went through example after example from completely different areas is that they all kind of rely on the same sorts of principles. Right? All of the sort of attempts at deception from trivial to massive cons all kind of rely on these same sorts of tendencies and habits. Yeah, in, in that sort of, if I to push this <laughs> comparison to Cialdini's book, right, who, who, you know, went to sales training workshops to try to figure out, like, what are we being, what are what are uh, salespeople being told to do? And, like, what are their kind of common themes in that and sort of distill these, these six common themes in those? And I wondered, as I was reading, like, are there cases in which these instances of fraud and scam artistry have been the inspiration for psychological research, right? Because you could reverse engineer it and go like, oh, we just found a bunch of cases. And look, we can connect the dots to establish science. But I was curious whether there are instances in which researchers go like, gee, <laughs> could it really have been this that made people succumb to this act of, of scam artistry? That's a that's a really good question. And I think the most obvious example is magic, and Dan can talk more about that, although magic is sort of overt deception as opposed to the, you know, and we talk about magic in the book, but as I, as I started cycling through in my mind, I was thinking of a sort of like financial fraud, Ponzi schemes, fake news, and so on. It, I, it, the, the, certainly those of especially fake news and misinformation have become a major topic in psychological research in the last, you know, five or six, seven years, and in all of social science, in fact. But I don't see that much research inspired by, let's say, financial fraud and financial scams or sports cheating. I mean, there's definitely some research, but it's, I don't think it's sort of like the, you know, it's so much of a, a major, you know, a major threat. I mean, maybe Dan has a good answer on magic no, and some of the other parts I, of it. I think there are a couple of examples that we talk about in the book. One is, is uh, Madoff's consistency, right? So one of the, uh, one of the frauds that i uh, Madoff used lots and lots of the sorts of techniques we talked about in the book. Um, but what was unusual about his Ponzi scheme wasn't that, you know, he did, it wasn't a traditional Ponzi scheme. He didn't offer people 50% returns with guarantees, right? He instead gave people really steady returns, impossibly steady returns. You know, you get 8 to 12% every year uh, with never a down year and almost never a down month, right? So it was that security that was the big deal. And there have been studies that have looked at um, do money managers or you know investors find that kind of consistency particularly appealing right so it's it's basically taking what madoff did showing them his results versus other more realistic up and down sorts of results and even knowing about madoff's fraud people prefer the one that's really steady right? so that that's one example I, I think another example of sort of um i don't it's not quite scam or con but um classic studies of people in cults, right? And, you know, how they, how they think about having been in a cult. Um, you know, you could say that in some cases those were applying psychology based on what happened in that con and trying to figure out why people would continue to believe something even when the evidence was, you know, accumulating outside of their worldview. Um, 
But yeah, I think Chris is right. That the, the most obvious domain is science of magic. And, yeah. and that was kind of, I think, where my the question came from, because I knew that there was that area where it was like, oh, people have like looked at these curiosities of how people's attention has been taken advantage of and use that as like the core premise of trying to figure out like, well, how widespread is this? Like how fundamental to thinking is this? And I, I didn't know if the same had been done in quite the same way with the sorts of stories you covered. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I, th I think that sort of science of magic and thinking about deliberate deception and how how it functions, how it takes advantage of sort of our cognitive tendencies um, is is probably the best clear example of it. And it's an unusual case in that, of course, people attending a magic performance know that they're being deceived, right? So they're they're doing everything they can to counter it. Whereas in our daily lives, we don't think about the possibility that we're going to be deceived. Right? And the people who are deceiving us do everything they can to make themselves not look like magicians, right? <laughs> they want us to not think about it as a magic performance that's got a trick involved, right? Um, instead, they just want to appeal to us, draw our attention where they want it, focus on the information that they want us to focus on, just like a magician does, but without that sort of performance element of it or, yeah, showmanship. I was curious about the the magic angle too, and, and what your guys' history with it is. It comes up several times in the book. Tony Barnhart is the guy who connected us, and so that's that's his whole deal. And you know, as I read about this kind of stuff, like I have a, a long history of magic in you know growing up, and to me, that's I think like why I am quite on guard for these kinds of things, right? Because you just see so many instances where you go like, oh, these dumb little things that magicians have been using forever are this exact same kinds of things that people in the world are doing under cover of normalcy, apparently. Um, and so, and and also I know like the invisible gorilla has been taken into account when people talk about magic. So like, what is, what is your relationship <laughs> with the world of magic? Have you gotten roped into it by having done research on it? Or is this more deep a part of you as chess seems to no, be? I'm not, I'm not a magician at all, um, but I'm fascinated by magic. I haven't really ever done any, I, I, Try to learn a few tricks, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not a magician. But um, I, I got into it years ago, um, just reading about magic and trying to learn from magicians. Um, so I, I think uh, the thing that really triggered a lot of my interest was a, a scientific study of consciousness conference session um, many years ago that was held in Las Vegas, and they brought in people like you know Teller and Matt King and you know Paula Robbins, other people to talk about how they think about awareness, right? how they think about attention. It's just a fascinating session. I've kept up with some of those folks since then. And then I've taught a graduate course on psychology magic several times now, um, which, which is fun as a cognitive psychologist, but not a magician, right? that we're interested in what we can learn from magicians about cognitive psychology. And now that there's a whole literature on the cognitive psychology of magic, we can look at both. But the idea is to read about magic theory and to read about cognitive psychology about magic and those handful of people like Tony Barnhart and Gustav Kuhn and others who are both psychologists and magicians and are kind of combining the two um, in, in their work. So you know, it's, it's something that I've actively sort of followed for a long time because it really is, I mean, the development of things like the gorilla video and selective looking and selective attention in cognitive psychology, we're pretty much independent of magic. Right? Those, you know, our, our study was a replication of Nicer's work from the 1970s, and Nicer's work was building on dichotic listening from the 1950s. Right, so there's a long history that had nothing really to do with magic directly, but the intersection is obvious. It's like two streams joined at the same point in the end, like because yeah. now you see like in stage performances, you see gorillas like you know in the background <laughs> that you're not supposed to notice and so on. But I think. You know, Dan knows the history much better than I do, but as, as far as I understand, it's really sort of two professional lines of thought, you know, one scientific, one performance and sort of expertise, you know, oriented, you know, arriving at, you know, very similar understanding of of things. Yeah, sorry, with different with different ways of going about it, right? I mean, magic arrived at, at principles of misdirection over, you know, hundreds or maybe over a thousand years. Um, developing sort of an idea about when it matters and when it doesn't, and which sorts of factors are likely to matter in practice and which ones aren't. And you know, obviously with some possible superstitious beliefs as well, if, if, if you want to kind of over, overdo everything so that you're sure it's going to work, right? there's going to be lots of things you throw in that might improve the performance, but might not be necessary to the mechanisms. Um, 
but you know, cognitive psychology is kind of arrived at it more indirectly by studying limits on attention, and that was the that was the path to, you know, what are what are the extreme consequences of limited attention? I would say it's it's very similar with all kinds of deceptions, actually, like you know, fraudsters, scammers, con artists. They have their own, you know, intuitive, sometimes maybe completely unappreciated, you know, not pers- they don't, they're not aware of the fact that they are sort of, you know, amateur psychologists in a sense, or at least they're forming their own, you know, ideas about what works and what doesn't work and why. And they arrive at sort of the same place as, you know, many branches of psychology have. And I think one thing we tried to do in the book was sort of come up with a framework that it doesn't really, you know, it's not really, it doesn't use a lot of, um, fancy scientific terms and concepts, but really a framework that people can use to understand what those techniques are and why they work and and what, you know, and what you might be able to do about them. So we, we sort of use some terms in the book a little bit uh, differently, maybe from how they might be used directly in the scientific literature. But we sort of did that on purpose as in a way to sort of help people like come up with a relatively easy framework, you know, of, uh, that they could understand sort of how all these different, all these different kinds of scammers, con artists, deceivers, you know, we'll leave the magicians out of it, but, you know, are trying to, you know, are trying to take advantage of, of them psychologically in a way. Yeah, there's, there's, um, you know, in thinking about like, the benefit of that science of magic thing is that crosstalk between magicians and scientists. Presumably, there aren't a ton of con artists who are like, let me share <laughs> the secrets to my success. But but wouldn't that be useful, right, to be able to to do that? And, and my sense is that the kind of habits of mind that you use to organize things in the book are kind of like the analysis of these scams and not so much straight from the horse's mouth, people going, oh, well, we know, like we figured out that people don't ever look over there <laughs> when we're talking to them. And so that's where we put the secret. Um is that right? This is mostly like an analysis of these as opposed to like we're getting this straight from the con artists themselves. I wouldn't trust yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> like I would yeah. I, <laughs> like you know catch me if you can the famous mm-hmm. you know book uh, by Frank Abagnale like now apparently there's an exposé about that arguing that most of what he said <laughs> in the book about his own exploits and how he did it is totally exaggerated made up you know not not to be relied on and Shocker. and so on. But but sometimes there's an interesting sort of confessional or you know something like that but that's that, that's not, I think, that was not our main source, you know, in the book by any means. It was really more sort of like, I will I will tell you, like, we, we listened to lots of podcasts, we watched lots of series, we read lots of books and, and so on. And it was really it, it kind of putting putting those up against our own understanding of, you know, of, of why people might be deceived that sort of, I think, led to this framework. It's just what were the recurring patterns, you know, that, that come out when just looking at how it happened without even bothering to ask them how they did it. You can sort of infer, you know, from just the details that are public about these things, how it, how it works. Some, sometimes you can also get insight in uh, based on how a scam changes over time, right? How, how it morphs. So uh, one nice example of this is uh, call center scams, right? So um, calling people up under pressure, uh, telling them that they're being investigated by the IRS or they owe money and telling them to go buy gift cards and then transfer the codes over the phone to pay off the debt. It's it's never, ever, ever go buy a gift card <laughs> at, or a cash card at a store because if somebody on the phone is insisting that you must do that to pay off, never do that. That's always a scam. Um, but one thing that changed in there, so they refined their scripts, right? They get better and better at stoking fear, putting in time pressure, um, as a way of motivating you to not question. Um, but they've also done something more recently that mimics what the Nigerian email uh, scam does, right? You, you get this ridiculous email, and anybody who listens to this podcast or has read about psychology or has studied magic knows, like, yeah, this is garbage, right? You, you, you are not the target audience for that email. Most of the people listening to this are not the target audience for that email because it's filled with typos and makes no sense. Um, but that's, a, that's deliberate, right? They want only the most gullible to respond and engage so they don't have to waste their time with people who aren't going to send them money. So the call center scams have done the same thing, right? They, instead of actually directly calling people, they send robocalls and give a number to call back. And anybody who calls back has been self-selected into the gullible category. So that saves the call center scammers huge amounts of time because it can count on that selection process. Yeah, that was a very revealing moment in the book for me. The like, oh, this whole scam that we all know doesn't need to change 
and that's a feature of it, right? Like by by being so blatant and just like laying out all the clues, you just weed out all the people who are going to waste your time uh, because they th- they're going to catch on eventually, um, and and all that's left are the people who are going to be quite willing to to comply. And that, that's, that's the, the most important, right? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. the most important feature of that of that scam because it's very labor intensive for them to reel someone in. They'll spend hours and hours and hours on on the phone, months and months and months. In the case of the Nigerian email scam, trying to get people to wire money, they can't afford to waste time on someone who's not going to come through, right? So the most important aspect of that scam is pre, you know, kind of like sales principles: pre qualify your pre qualify your sales leads, right? Well, they 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 let you pre qualify yourself. It's 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 brilliant. I mean, I have to. <laughs> have, to, have to congratulate them for you know such an effective you know form of crime, um, and so you know well exploiting the the math you know basically the math of the situation right and and it, it also I think it leads us to have a misleading view of how these things work sometimes. So that we talked in the book a little bit about this this um, French Israeli con artist named Gilbert Shikli who would call people up and talk them into doing all kinds of crazy things like, you know, withdraw money from their company and wire it to some Hong Kong bank account or something like that. And he did this by pretending to be the CEO of the of the company. And what what's not really talked about very much is how many people he must have called before he found the one that he could he could do it. But nobody ever talked about those. So the legend became he can talk anybody into doing anything, you know, as long as he has a phone, like, you know, then which is a completely wrong impression of, of how these of how these things work. I, I would say we're all vulnerable. Like there's some kind of scam that, that could catch any one of us. Like we shouldn't think we're above it just because the Nigerian email scam seems farcical to us and we don't think we'd ever do it. There's probably some way someone could talk us into something, but it really uh, is not sort of like an all purpose approach or, you know, only the gullible people. It's really much more targeted than that. It reminds me, a I, I thing that I always thought would be fun. I haven't quite had the nerve to do it is to start every time I meet someone asking like, wait, is your birthday April 3rd? And I'm going to get that wrong every time. But the one time I'm right, that person is going to have the most incredible story to tell <laughs> about this bizarre guy who just like knew their yeah. birthday out of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, it, it illustrates the sort of information asymmetries between, you know, the, the conned and the conners, right? So we, we don't know how many times Gilbert Shickley called up other people. He does, right? We only see the times when he happened to be successful. So you're, if you're approaching people and asking them, is your birthday April 3rd, right? They don't know how many people you've asked. They only know that one moment, right? And they think it has much more meaning because they're not thinking about whether, they're not thinking about the weird possibility that you're actually asking everybody mm-hmm. what, right. whether right. birthday is April 3rd, <laughs> yeah. right? And I mean, that's how a lot of magic works too, right? People just don't think about how much effort a magician might actually have gone to. There's, there's no to way they would do that. Create this sort of situation. Yeah, they, they wouldn't do something <laughs> that mm-hmm. dumb. They wouldn't spend three months memorizing some, right. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's all what you see is all there is, right? Like they're right. not thinking about what's missed. The missing information is how many times the scammer tried the same thing on other people or how many times the psychic you know, offered a different like first name or letter or something like that. And nobody raised their hand, right? Because that all goes by so fast that nobody's thinking about it when finally like the sob story about the cancer, you know, about the death from cancer comes out, right? You're focused completely on that and not, you know, not all the little, you know, sparks that that uh, didn't lead to any fires. And the point too of the, of the of the birthday ploy is that every time you get it wrong, it's like a non-event. They go, you go, oh, I, I don't know why I thought that. And then no one remembers that. Uh, in the same way that you get this weird call and you go, oh, that was sort of strange. But it doesn't raise enough of an alarm for it to shut down the whole operation. These kind of like innocuous trials that when they hit, you're in. But when they don't hit, you're you're no worse off. It's like the times when you zip through the grocery store checkout line. Right. It doesn't register. But the times that you're stuck <laughs> right. there for an hour, right. you register. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I'm curious a little bit about sort of the, the practicality of guarding against these kinds of things, right? Because the book is sort of set up to say, like, here are steps that you can take to pull this off. Um, and so so one approach to doing that is I was thinking just by way of uh, recapping the kind of central premise of the book, I think, is this notion of truth bias, that by default, we often just assume that the things that we encounter are true. And that's adaptive. It makes sense that we would have a, a bias like that. And so you could say the best alternative is to instead adopt a falsehood bias and just go like, just assume everything is wrong until you get confirmation. So now that I've established the polar, like farthest away <laughs> edge, uh, how viable is that? And where might you instead? I'm guessing you're going to say that's not viable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> how, how, how do we adjust from that to something that's a little more reasonable? 
Well, it's, it's so absurdly unviable that, you know, we couldn't probably survive, right, mm-hmm. if we were that paranoid and that compulsive about checking everything and, and believing no one. And, you know, that that's why it's a great premise for a movie, trust no one, you know, like you can't possibly trust no one. Um, uh, it's, I mean, I will say it's it's hard to, it, it's hard to strike the balance, right? It's might sometimes not obvious when you should be checking more and when you should be just accepting things. Um, but, you know, one key is to think about the stakes that are involved, right? So if they mischarged you at the checkout line at a department store, it's probably not such a big deal. Of course, you can check if you want, you know, and uh, uh, make sure that your credit card bill is not filled with false charges and so on. But if you're selecting your money manager or picking which political candidate to support or what you're going to believe about uh, a pandemic or something like that, it's maybe a good idea to spend a little more effort going into the quality of the, you know, the sources and the claims that they're making and actually checking references. And one thing that sort of is surprising in retrospect, when looking back on a lot of the stuff we covered in the book, is how little checking often people did when the stakes were so high, or how their checking sort of didn't include basic questions they might have wanted to ask. Like there's a, you know, there's a story about a museum exhibition in in, in, um, in Orlando, Florida, where you know, a lot of um, paintings by um, Jean-Michel Basquiat were exhibited. uh, And, you know, it turns out the most likely thing is that they were all forgeries. I mean, the case is not resolved yet, but the FBI raided the museum and seized all these paintings. Um, And it turns out that the people who sold or, or, you know, provided the paintings to the museum to exhibit them all had been convicted of fraud in the past. And so, you know, one thing one might want to do is check if the people you're dealing with on large matters of substance, like your career as a, you know, as a, an art curator and your, you know, your reputation as a museum, you know, you might want to look into a little more. That's a rough guidance, but it, it does sort of strike the balance a little bit between extreme cynicism and, you know, just total naive acceptance. Yeah. And, you know, you can think about, I think coming back to magic, you can think about how much effort would somebody go to? Right. Well, a magician will go to a tremendous amount of effort for a stage show because it makes their show work. Right. And they'll go to far more effort than an audience will give them credit for because the stakes to an audience member are low. Right. But if you are looking to buy a piece of fine art, something that, you know, I've never done, but if you're looking to buy a piece of fine art and it costs, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or more, right. How much effort would somebody go to if they wanted to pass off a forgery and get that much money out of you? a ton, right? I mean, they do a lot of legwork to make that sale because it's worth a lot of money to them, right? The the effort would easily compensate them. They could spend a year or more fabricating provenance for something because they're going to make it back. So um, thinking about it in terms of what what efforts would somebody go to to fool me? Um, And maybe those are the cases where if if somebody would go to a lot of effort to fool me, maybe those are at times when I should be thinking about it a little more critically. Yeah, as I was reading the book, I was thinking I could write a counterpoint book called Chill Out because I feel like my individual default is a little too far (laughs) in the other direction where I'm a little too cautious, a little too skeptical, and gosh, wouldn't it be nice to just like let go (laughs) a little bit. And and that's where that question of the balance comes in, right? You go... I think that's right. right? You you do want to... You know, you do want to kind of get by in life without constantly being skeptical of everything, right? I mean, that that's, you know, sort of a disastrously negative way of going through life. And for the most part, people are honest. For the most part, you're not going to be in a, a grand con, right? Um, you know, most of our daily lives, yeah, we might get cheated on a small scale, you know, but should we care about that? Like, well, n- maybe not, right? Maybe Maybe those are not the kinds of things to worry about too much. And it's really only when there's consequential you know, deception that we should be paying more attention. I, I, th- I think bringing it back to bringing it back to chess for a minute, of all things, um, you know, one thing that that great chess players can do is they can recognize patterns in the way the pieces are on the board that amateurs and beginners and even lesser masters, you know, can't see. And part of the goal of this book, I think, is by showing people the patterns that exist and all kinds of things that happen around us in the world, like from political campaigns to advertising, to scientific claims, to finance and so on. If people, you know, read the whole book, think about these stamps, maybe look into a few of them a little more deeply that interest them, or maybe they've already watched some of the movies and so on about these things. You can get better at recognizing the patterns 
right away and sort of sensing when there might be deception involved, as opposed to when people might just be making honest mistakes or, you know, when if there is deception involved, it's not high stakes, you know, or it's not something that people are going through a lot of effort for. Um, that maybe makes, you know, enables you to chill out a little bit more, right? Like a chess grandmaster doesn't win games by constantly like searching everything. Like, you know, that's the way computers play chess, right? A chess grandmaster wins games by learning how to recognize pretty quickly when they should think more and when they should just play the most obvious move, right? You know, and so, so often in life, we have to just play the most obvious move and, and move on with things, but sometimes we really need to analyze. And it's pattern recognition, I think, in terms of fraud and deception that can help you, you know, help you help you get there um, more quickly than hard you know, hard experience would be the, would be the slower yeah. and worse way to get there. there. There's a, a part of me thinks that in some ways, the most useful thing is just describing so many different cases of cons and scams because you sort of go like, Oh, so this happens all the time. Like it's maybe not like every decision I make, but you start to get a sense of like, Oh, it it's worth being a little cautious. Even if I, I can't isolate like what, trick they're pulling on me, just a sense of like, it seems like something's off here. And it kind of reminds me, there's this model in social psychology of how to get people to break out of stereotyping others. And the premise of it is built on the idea that like, you just kind of have to make that mistake once or twice and go, oh, I jumped to this conclusion. I shouldn't have assumed this about this person. But now I know this is a situation that gets me in trouble, right? So the next time I'm in that situation, a little alert goes off and goes, hey, this is where we want to be careful and like not leap to the first conclusion. And it kind of seems to me that like some of this is just going like, oh, I'm attentive to the kinds of scams these are. I feel like uh, I, I was having flashbacks to early internet days when it felt like just looking at the wrong email would destroy your computer. Uh, <laughs> and you just sort of like get a, this intuitive sense for, oh, this this is wrong. Like this text I'm getting yeah. clearly is not, it doesn't have the, the signals that I look for in something that's authentic. Um, and so in terms of helping people, that that's one way, but I kind of just want to turn it to you guys in terms of lessons that, that you like to share about being on guard for these kinds of things. Yeah. I, th I think that example of, of changing kind of stereotype beliefs is, is a good one because, you know, that's something that we encounter daily all the time, right? That, you know, you come to the wrong conclusion, you jump to a quick in interpretation of somebody based on appearance or other th other factors. We don't want to have to go through being conned repeatedly um, in order to, to learn that. And the cons are different enough that if you learn the kind of the surface features of the con, that's not going to help you avoid another one, right? So that was part of our goal here was to see if we could give people that experience of, hey, here's the same principles played out in so many different ways. Maybe one of them connects to you. Maybe it triggers that sort of red flag that hey, I'm being roped in here, right? And, you know, what should I think about if I'm being roped in? What are the questions I should be asking myself to, to verify that this is right? Um, another thing that I think, you know, we, we try and emphasize a little bit is there are contexts in which you want to kind of pre-check, right? Just set things up for yourself so that you don't actually have to question everything all the time. And um, we give the kind of classic Van Halen M&M example um, where they... They put a rider in their in their touring uh, guide that their their dressing room had to have a bowl of M and M's bowl of M and M's, but with no brown ones, right? And it's like it's not like they didn't like brown M and M's; they all taste the same, right? Um, but they could use that as a check on whether people were being careful and conscientious, right? So, if they come to the room and there's brown M and M's in the bowl, then they know somebody wasn't paying enough attention, and maybe they should be worried about the rigging for their stage show, which could actually kill people. Right. Um, whereas if they're attentive to detail, then they're probably OK in that context, or at least there should be less concern there because people are paying attention to every detail that they asked about. Um, so that sort of, you know, preventative checking where you, you don't have to check every single time can be a really useful tool. I guess I would I, I guess I would say um, to two of my favorite chapters in the book are about um, what we call commitments and um, what we call efficiency. So commitments are things we believe very strongly, sort of strongly held assumptions that we don't think to question. And often those are exploited by, you know, by scammers and con artists. And being aware, I think, of how much those assumptions can sort of determine your future behavior and beliefs is really important. That's maybe one, you know, good takeaway. And another one is 
not being afraid to ask questions and seek more information. I think I've, I've sort of noticed that a lot of people, I think, find it very inhibiting to ask questions or to look for more information. They almost feel as though they're giving offense. Or that, you know, for example, the cost of asking a question of someone who won't like the question loom larger for them than the cost of like being, you know, taken in by failing to ask the question. Um, and, you know, there were people who weren't taken in by Bernie Madoff, and a lot of them were ones who asked a couple more questions. And when he either wouldn't answer them or gave sort of bullshit answers or was evasive, then they said, nope, I'm not sending my money to that guy and save like literally millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, so I think those, those two chapters are sort of two of my favorites. And I think that those might be ones where it sort of seems obvious in retrospect, but when you see so many examples of how this can cost you, it might sort of give people a new awareness of the importance of questioning your own assumptions and questioning what, you know, what, what other people are telling you in the right situations. Hmm. Yeah, suspicion is a dangerous social game, right? Like, you go, uh, I have these now competing goals. Like, I have these self preservation goals where, like, I really ought to be suspicious, but these social connection goals that if I, like, show that I don't trust you, like, that's going to hurt this relationship. And the problem is sometimes we care too much about how strangers <laughs> are relating yeah. to us when, yeah, a couple of uh, extra questions aren't going to hurt us in the long run socially. And of course, yep. the, best, the best con artists and deceivers play on that, right? They play on the social connection as much as possible and on the time pressure and on all of the other elements that we you know, find sort of off-putting if we want to ask them more, if we want to kind of be skeptical of them. So they're doing everything they can to make us less skeptical. I, I imagine you both have been generally critical thinkers <laughs> by virtue of the, the, what you do and, and how you spend your time. Uh, in writing the book, are there tools of thought that you found yourself leaning on more or discovering that you hadn't really considered before? Is there anything about the way you engage with the world personally that's changed as a function of writing this? I'm sure there is, um, <laughs> but I don't think it's like sort of one thing I can put my finger on. I, I do feel in writing the book and in studying all of the frauds and, and reading all this, you know, more so than the, the psychology, the events that we talk about, we really had to learn about in detail and so on. I feel like I have, uh, I'm much better now at spotting, you know, these kinds of deceptive and, and, you know, and, and, and fraudulent techniques out in the world. Maybe sometimes a little oversensitive, right? Like it's hard to, it's hard to get it exactly right. But I think in general, people are better off being a little more sensitive than, than less sensitive. Um, I, I think the number one, I would say that uh, if I had to put my finger on just one thing, I think my awareness has gone up of, um, the fact that the information that I'm thinking about at any one time is not necessarily the most relevant or the important, or it could be missing a critical piece. Kind of like we were talking about earlier, like all the times the psychic was wrong, all the times the stock guru like gave a wrong stock pick that he never talks about anymore. I mean, it, this marketing is pervasive, and this and it, some of it is not just marketing, but it's really attempts to deceive people into investing their money and you know and going with people who. You know, they've been right a couple of times, but they're no better than, you know, they're no better than the, the proverbial monkey throwing darts or whatever. I think I'm definitely more sensitive to to that kind of, uh, you know, scam or, or a misinformation attempt. And that, that's one of the hardest. I, I, I'm the same way that I, I find that I'm better able now to notice when we're getting partial information. But that's one of the hardest things to overcome because of that, what you see is all there is bias, right? I mean, there's a reason that you know, that the tech industry loves great demos, right? And so does psychology, right? You know, you, you produce a great demo and people assume that it's general to everything, right? And, you know, the number of, of psychology articles that will have a little narrow finding and then conclude that it applies to all of humanity, right? Um, we don't think about all of the one, all of the evidence that we don't have that is missing from that case. And, you know, that's something that I've kind of written about in psychology, the, the need for placing constraints on how general our results are. But we don't think about that in our daily lives. So you see this great VR demo and you don't think, OK, how many times did they have to set it up? Does it only work with this very narrow context? Um, you know, you, you see a, a truck driving by itself down the road like, OK, well, you know, how did it park? Um, did it do well doing that? Uh, you know, what was uh, was it only effective if they preloaded the route? Did it, they try it a bunch of times and this was the only one that worked? And it's like anytime 
every filmmaker knows, right? If you film a scene, you're going to film it multiple times to make sure you get a good cut. And well, is that a representative cut? I don't know, right? And more often than not, we don't get the opportunity to ask that, right? Like, and, but that's exactly the question we should be asked. Okay, that's a really cool demo. That's really neat. Um, how many times did you have to do that to get it to work? Right? It's a sort of positive way of you know, framing it. It's like, hey, I bet, I bet it took a lot of work to get that to work right. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> you know, okay, well, you know, how much work? <laughs> um, you, you won't believe how many times we had to tow the truck up that hill <laughs> and let it roll down before we got exactly the right camera <laughs> angle and everything. Yes. <laughs> Maybe they'll suddenly <laughs> disclose the whole thing to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, for me, the next time I'm dropping a million dollars on a painting, I'm going to do a background check on the guy who's selling it to me. So that was, you know, in my own personal life, that, that's the biggest <laughs> takeaway uh, that I got. Yeah, that's one of those that's not new effect many of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I want to, we're, we're out of time here. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk about the new book. And, and I hope people enjoy it. That was great chatting. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thanks for having us. That'll do it for another episode of Opinion Science. Thank you to Dan Simons and Chris Chabri for taking the time to talk about their new book. It's called Nobody's Fool, Why We Get Taken In and What We Can Do About It. You can get it right now at whichever bookshop or library you like most, probably. Check out the episode webpage for links to Dan and Chris's websites, as well as links to the book. For more on this show, OpinionSciencePodcast.com has what you need. Make sure you're subscribed to the show on whatever podcast device you're using right now. And follow me on X. (laughs) God, that sounds so much worse than follow me on Twitter. But this is the world we live in now. So follow me on X at Opinion SciPod. I'm also apparently on the 30 other new social media platforms, so just keep an eye out. And I'm thinking of starting a Patreon for this. Would you Patreon this show? I I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll, We'll see what happens. Okay, everyone, we're back in the groove now. Lots of good stuff on the way, so I will see you back here in a couple weeks for more Opinion Science. Bye bye